Hello? Come with me. We'll be speaking with Mr. John Hersey here at the Hersey Auditorium. And tonight, he'll be here to bid the class of 1978 a farewell. Show, there's still a lot of spirit at Hersey High School. There's no question about that. To start our program off today, I'd first of all like to ask Linda Brown to come to the podium, please, for a presentation. Linda? On behalf of the yearbook staff and everyone at John Hersey High School, it's my pleasure to present this copy of our 1978 endeavor to Mr. Hersey. And now, uh, Chris Anderson, would you please come to the podium, please? Could Nanook come up? <sighs> Nanook, to Mr. Hersey, I'd like to present the new um, addition to Hersey, Nanook, our mascot. So to Mr. Hersey, I'd like to present gifts that have been given and chosen for you. Thank you. And there was one gift that uh, was open just a little premature, and Kathy Nisi would like to present that in part of the seniors. Kathy? Um, this porcelain figurine was is from the senior class in appreciation for Mr. Hersey speaking at our graduation. Okay. 
a lot of you uh, over the past few years, uh, some of the faculty, of course, remember Mr. Hersey from his last visit here, but a lot of you have asked who is John Hersey, and uh, of course, many of you think of it as a school. Uh, the name John Hersey is certainly an institution. There's no question about that, one that is thought of very highly. And we're very, very pleased and very, very proud to have the man to whom this school is named for with us. We're also proud to have with us his daughter, Brooke. And I'd like to introduce Brooke at this time. Brooke, would you please stand? And now, without any further remarks to me, may I present Mr. John Hersey to all of you. Before I speak <clears throat> to the students, I wonder if Dixie Johnson would come up for a minute. <clears throat> I understand that you had bad luck and couldn't come to a dinner that was supposed to be in your honor. And it gives me great pleasure to give you this plaque presented in gratitude for your contribution to secondary education, Dixie A. Johnson, 18 years of service. It's a very great pleasure for me to be back at this school that has such a beautiful name. <laughs> I hear I have the cheering section up here. That's nice. Uh, seriously, it is, it is an enormous, I believe there can't be any greater honor for a living human being than to have his or her name on a building in which the future is being built. And I, I regard this as a very, very great honor. The last time I was here was 10 years ago for the dedication of the school. And just a few seconds after the plane on which I came here landed at O'Hare, there was, believe it or not, an earthquake. And I thought, this school is really going to shake things up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I am going to be saying a few words at the graduation tonight. I'll be congratulating the senior class for having survived. And this afternoon, I guess I should congratulate the underclassmen for their good fortune. <laughs> the underclassmen and the underclass women for their good fortune in not having to listen to that speech tonight. Some time ago, I read about a producer for CBS television who had visited 56 colleges doing a uh, documentary on higher education. And he said that one thing that he had come up was the knowledge that there was no commencement address which a skillful TV editor couldn't reduce to 15 seconds without any loss at all in content. So perhaps you are congratulated to be congratulated for 
missing those 15 seconds tonight. As a matter of fact, I hope to say something of interest and value to the seniors. But because that's going to be a little bit formal, we thought perhaps it would be more fun to be informal this afternoon and to talk with you in a very casual way with about things that may be interesting to you. And so I will just ask you to ask me some questions and I will try to answer them or say, no, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> but I'll have a shot at it if there's something to say. Now, who's first? I can only take one at a time and speak clearly up there in the stand. How did I ever get the school named after me? <laughs> it's a mystery and a wonder. <laughs> I understand that there was somebody in the school administration who thought that it would be nice to have a school name for somebody who is not dead. They looked around carefully and determined that I was not quite dead <laughs> and decided to name the school for me. I'm very grateful. Another question. Don't be shy. Uh, we did have a microphone, didn't we not set up here? Uh, where is it? Far end of the gym. Any of you who have questions, uh, to make things perhaps move a little bit easier and so everyone can hear the questions, why don't you move to the far end of the gym where there is a microphone in an orderly fashion and uh, we can proceed from that. Yes. I'd like to ask you, in what way, if any, do you feel your early childhood living in China affected your writing? <laughs> Did you hear the question? The question was, I think, how I feel my early childhood affected my writing. I was born in China. Uh, an, inde an indeterminate number of years ago and lived there till I was 10 years old. And uh, I believe that the, the one big effect that it had was in making me have my eyes open to people who were different from myself. Uh, that couldn't be avoided because I was in a minority in a strange country, and I saw great poverty, great hopes for the future, great possibilities, I think it made me feel uh, at least some that my eyes had to be open to other people who were not like myself. Okay, thank you. Thank you. How do you feel about getting the school named after you? Uh, thrilled. <laughs> I tried to say that a few minutes ago. I, I consider it a great honor. Thank you. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, why Johnny can't read uh, nor write. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. We hear, uh, we hear that uh, Johnny can neither read nor write. Um, as an educator and a writer, uh, do you think that's true, and how will it affect the uh, future of the written word? Uh, <laughs> the question is about whether people are reading these days enough for the, re the written word to survive. The fact of the matter is that there's more reading going on now each year 
than in each previous year. Uh, there are more books sold each year than in each previous year. Uh, I think this is in the face of great difficulties for reading because TV is easy to watch and ple a pleasure to watch. And uh, it, it is that uh, many who might read get their pleasure from watching the tube. However, I think reading is different from watching television because when you read, you have to make the pictures in your own mind. And this is a creative act. And in the end, for those who find out the pleasure, it's a greater pleasure. So I believe that reading will survive and uh, that, that the schools will help us to keep it alive. Uh, I believe this and hope it uh, because I'm a writer and uh, I wouldn't eat if it weren't true. <laughs> so. Is there, any, is there any character in any of your books that you equate with yourself? The question is, is there any character in any, any of my books that I equate with myself? An author, when he writes a fictional character, usually starts with a model, somebody he or she knows and thinks about. But before long, that model disappears in the character and some of the author goes into the character and some of other people go into the character and the character becomes a kind of combination and begins to have a life of, of its own. Uh, so I would say that there's a little bit of me in every character I write. I can't help that because I'm writing out of my memory uh, I don't mean to have the characters be like myself, and I don't think of that any of my characters really are, but I can't help having them be somewhere part of my dream, part of my imagination, and part of my memory. We all... We all know that there are a lot of problems today, and if you were to write a book on one of them in order to help change it, what would you write about and what would you want changed in order to help the problem? The question is, uh, there are a lot of problems these days, and if I were to choose one to write about, what would I choose now? I think I would choose the one that I have chosen all along in an indirect way, and that is the problem of war and peace, because I believe that violence is the, is the great danger in our lives. And I believe that, that everything that can be done to prevent violence and to prevent another war must be done. And if I can do anything through my writing to help people to understand each other, open up their minds to each other, that's what I would like to be able to do. Are there any more questions? Uh, faculty, uh, students, otherwise, you can come up here or you can use the mic at the back. There's one more. Uh, since writing is such a competitive field to get into, what kind of advice would you give to young writers? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I said that since writing is such a competitive field, what kind of advice would you give to young writers today? Write and read. Those are the only two things I can say. Uh, if you are to learn how to write, it must be from the masters, read. Uh, it's no use saying you want to be a writer, you have to write. That's all I can, that's the only advice I can give you. Go to work. Yeah, 
Um, hi, Misa. Are you writing a book at the present time? And if so, what? Uh, so what is a good question. Uh, yes, I'm writing a novel. I'm not ready to talk about it because I've found in the past that if I talk about what I'm writing about, uh, it disappears in thin air. So I can't really go into what it is yet, but I'm starting work on a novel. I'm also, this summer, working on a very interesting project. It's a long article about the year 1968, the year in which I last came to this school. 1968 was a dramatic year. It was a year in which the, South, the North Vietnamese put on the Tet Offensive, which made this country, I think, unconsciously realize that we were going to lose the war in Vietnam. It was the year of the My Lai Massacre, in which we had to realize that Americans were capable of atrocity. It was the year in which Martin Luther King was assassinated. It was the year in which Robert Kennedy was assassinated. It was the year in which the Chicago Convention, at which Hubert Humphrey was nominated, produced terrible violence. Uh, it was the year in which Nixon was elected. It was a year in which Columbia University blew up and, and the, there was a revolt in Paris and the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia. It was a year of terrific turmoil in which uh, we had to go through a whole new way of looking at ourselves in this country. Now, 10 years later, we seem very far away from that. Uh, but a lot of the problems that, were, that we were struggling about in 68 are still with us. And we've got to face them and think about them and move on, I hope, to a more peace, peaceful and fruitful world. It's a long answer to a short question. Um, what changes have you noticed in students today from the past 10 years and when you were here last? Well, when I was here last, uh, in this year that I've just been talking about, students were in revolt. They were dissatisfied with what they saw around them. It was a year of a great deal of, of violence for young people uh, and a year also in which there were a lot of students who, who felt that they dropped out of society. Nowadays, there are, don't seem to be so many signs on the surface of that kind of dissatisfaction and alienation. I myself feel that the students today are just as concerned as those students were 10 years ago about the problems of our society, about poverty, pollution, violence, and the other kinds of distress that we have. And they want to do something about it, but it seems to me that the effort now is a more, more creative one. People are trying to figure out what they can do in this world in a small way to help with these problems. And uh, that seems to me to be the major difference between the students then and the students now. That should happen to our radio man. <laughs> Your house will look good, toilet papered. How did you come about the quote that we see out in front of the school about how a school is not learning to live? Well, I have five children, and it seemed to me as they grew up that school for them shouldn't be a place to learn about life because they were alive while they were in school and they should be living their lives in school. 
and that they should be learning from the ways in which they lived rather than simply living about life. That's really why it came about. <laughs> How many books have you written and what do you think was your best? I don't honestly know how many. I think 18 or 19. I haven't counted. <laughs> I'm sorry. Which I like best. I just told you I have five children. If you ask me which of my five children I like best, do you think I would tell you? <laughs> I love them all. I know they have faults. I know they're not perfect, but I love them all. <laughs> Athletics are being rated over academics these years? Say it again, please. Do you feel that the athletics are being rated over academics in a high school? Well, it depends on the high school. Uh, in some, yes, in some, no. I gather that when the uh, valedictorian pictures were taken down here ahead of the athletic pictures, that there was some comment. And uh, that seems to me to suggest that there is a balance going here anyhow. I hope so. Seems so. Is there? <laughs> Are there any other questions now? Anyone has at this moment? We have time for one more if there's one more. Well, we do want to thank you all for coming to the assembly. Um, Mr. Keneva, or Mr. I should ask first of all, Mr. Hersey, do you have any closing comments that you'd like to make? There is one thing I would like to mention, though it hasn't been asked me as a question. I read in the correspondence not long ago about a visit to this school by some representatives of the neo-Nazi party. And I know that there's been some comment and turmoil about that. I wanted to ask you if there's anyone here who can tell me what the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States uh, concerns. Freedom of speech. Yes, I hear those words. And I simply wanted to say that it is my feeling that if high school students are old enough to watch television, to watch movies, to live in the streets of our cities, and to read all the books that are published, then I think they're old enough in their school life to face and talk about the most serious issues that we have that are going these days. Uh, I don't agree with the point of view of those gentlemen who came in the school. I very strongly disagree with their point of view. But I would fight for their right to say what they want to say. I believe this very strongly because I think that <clears throat> if you deprive them of the right to say those things, then what they want is much more apt to come than if they're allowed to speak, speak their minds. <clears throat> I reserve the right to speak my mind in answer, and uh, I think that, that it's valuable for students to be exposed to differing points of view, to make up their minds, and to be able to speak their minds about whatever they believe in.